would like to say just a few words of introduction to those who are hearing my strange tale for the very first time. Now, first of all, I would like to make clear to you my expectations of you, the audience, which might not be what you think. Most people, when they hear this story, say, well, that's wonderful. I like it very much. I hope it's true. I wish it were true. Well, prove it to me. Then they sit back waiting for the proof. But since I am talking to people with completely closed minds, no matter what one said, whatever proof one gave, it would not be believed. So if it's proof you come to hear, then I'm afraid you have made the wrong journey, got on the wrong bus. What I say is by nature of prophecy, and it is obvious you cannot prove a prophecy until it has taken place. So how do I come by this information? Well, without intending to be, without even thinking of myself as, I suppose I'm a prophet. I don't try to be a prophet. I don't set out to be a prophet. I don't especially want to be a prophet. But if I say what I believe to be true, I'm a prophet. <laughs> what I'm really doing is passing on to you information that has come my way. If it is prophecy, well, so it is. If it is fantasy, all right, wait and see. Since there's no way I can actually 100% prove to you that what I'm saying is actually taking place, all I can do is ask you to have an open mind. I don't mean an empty mind, I mean an open mind. <laughs> open to the possibility that this information may be true. <coughs> the fact that I have given out information over the years which has indeed become true, proven itself over and over again, might give you some encouragement to keep a positively open mind. So rather than asking you to believe this, because I'm not asking you to believe it, really I don't mind whether you believe it or not. For myself, I know from my own experiences and contacts that this is true. But that doesn't necessarily convince you. These are my experiences, not yours. But having been given these experiences through my contacts, I have been asked to make the information known and on the widest possible front. And that is what I do. My advice is not necessarily to accept it and say, oh, that's fine, that's all that's true, wonderful. Nor reject it otherwise. I, to, uh, to, to take, or to reject it, but to think, well, it may be true. I should keep an open mind. And that's what I ask you to do. But of course, we don't always have an open mind. It depends what we're hearing, whether we allow our minds to look at it openly or to bring to bear on it all our prejudices. I don't think an open mind is as widespread a faculty in the human mind as most of us think. Most of us will say, hand on heart, yes, I've got an open mind, that's fine. That's all I have. An open mind, say what you like, I will view it with an open mind. 
mind. I don't believe it. I find as I speak all over the world that a truly open mind is actually relatively rare. Where people have what we call the inner knowledge, the knowledge of the soul, of the heart, then it is likely that you will find an open mind. But what people call an open mind is usually the sum total of what they have received from their parents, from their school teachers, from the city, from the country, from the people around them, and that has formed their opinions. Now, an open mind has nothing to do with opinions. It's a direct, open looking at what you're hearing and evaluating it objectively. And that is very, very rare. So whether you have an open mind or not, if you go home this evening with a renewed hope, hope for yourself, your family, your children, and their children, and their children, then I shall be perfectly satisfied. We are living, as you all know, in a very problematical world. Things are very difficult in the world today. Half the world, the once rich half of the world, is going through a process of financial and economic destruction. Yet at the same time, there are dozens, some hundreds of extraordinary miracle happenings in the world, all over the world, unexplainable. And in another field, there is a growing visibility, amounting to hundreds and sometimes thousands of UFOs in the world, all over the world about which humanity knows practically nothing and about which very recently over a hundred ex-military from in the United States of America held a conference at which they came forward and declared their interest in and knowledge of UFOs for over 60 years, but which their military status forbade them to make known at the time. Is there a connection between, between all these different happenings? I would say absolutely, certainly yes. They are all interconnected happenings in our world. A world which is threatened by global warming, by lack of commodities, lack of food in one part, and overproduction in other parts, and a lessening belief that humanity can get through this extraordinary, strange time in our lives. I would say that the problems in the world today, on all fronts, are the result of and can be seen as the birth pangs of a new civilization which is struggling to be made known. If one says this is a cosmic manifestation, most people will think about peoples because they think of cosmos as all powerful and the result is always something tragic and tremendous upheavals. Some indeed of cosmic influence it produces upheavals, but these cosmos is wider than somebody standing with a sledgehammer making a noise. Cosmos 
can manifest in the most silent way through the most silent energies. And these things are not different, they are part of the cosmic whole. The major cosmic event happening as far as this earth is concerned is the fact that we are part of a process of entering into a new cosmic cycle, which simply because it is happening, inevitably at our level produces change, sometimes tremendous changes. So we are entering into a new state, a new world, a new age or cycle. How does this happen? How does, is it just a story, an idea, or is it a factual event? I suggest to you that it is a perfectly recognizable, accessible, factual, cosmic event to do with the movement of our solar system, of which this planet is a part, round the heavens in relation to the constellations of the, our zodiac. It is a scientific astronomical event, of which, of course, we have no influence. And you can verify this by a visit to any observatory. The astronomer scientists would say it is the result of the precession of the equinoxes. Now that's true, but it's so dense, so not clear, that a clearer way to visualize it is to say that it is the result of the movement of our solar system round the heavens in relation to the constellations of the zodiac. Our sun is making such a journey in space with its planets, which takes approximately 25 to 26,000 years to complete. Then it has made a complete circle of the, of the uh, zodiac passing through each constellation in turn, taking roughly 2,150 years to do so. For the last 2,150 years, that constellation was the constellation of Pisces, the fish. Today, our sun has passed through the constellation of, of Pisces and is, has entered into the beginning of a journey through the constellation of Aquarius. This will take approximately 2,350 years or so, approximately. You see, this is happening and we can do nothing about it, but it is happening. And any astronomer will tell you it is happening. But if you ask a journalist, is such a thing happening in a new age? He said, no, don't be rubbish. That's rubbish. Nonsense. <laughs> that doesn't exist. It's all these Americans, you know, in Western <laughs> California. They think up nonsense and then it spreads around the world. So you cannot say a scientific truth without it being put down by the all-knowing journalist. So you're either foreign your age or you're not. not you believe in it or you don't. You can prove that it is true, but you don't have to believe the truth, do you? Now, as our solar system is passing through the constellations, it becomes inundated with the energy which is streaming out into space from these constellations. And these energies are not inert, they're not dead, they are filled with consciousness, filled with being, filled with quality. And 
as far as the energies of Pisces of the last 2,000 odd years, and now idealism and individuality are a strong common <coughs> ground of the, of the forces of humanity today. 2,000 years ago, of course, there were some people who were individuals, but they were the outstanding people, the kings and queens and powers, people of power and rulers, and the everyday people of the world were, had the consciousness of, of a herd, not individual at all. But over the last 2,000 years, they have manifested that individuality throughout the world. It is one of the outstanding features of humanity today. These qualities of Pisces began to withdraw as the sun moved away from their sphere of influence as it moved towards Aquarius. This began in 1625. So from 1625 onwards, the quality of the energies of Pisces began to weaken and weaken and weaken. If one or other of these energies dominated, there would be less of a problem. But since they are roughly equal, the energies of Pisces are a little stronger still than the energies of Aquarius, but they are roughly equal. They present us with the problem where humanity is dis divided. The older people of the world who inherited all these qualities, all these tendencies, all the, all the different structures <coughs> led to them their concept of life. And then there's the younger people who have not had time to experience all of that but who come in and can quickly respond to the new energies, the energies of Aquarius, and find that these produce in them a completely different demand from life than those held by their fathers and mothers and grandfathers and all the, going back the generations which has satisfied them, but does not satisfy the young of today. <coughs> and the reason why nothing seems to work today, whatever the governments of the world do, they cannot reach something which will last, something which has the inner stability which humanity needs whether that's in the political or the, especially in the economic field. We have a series of booms followed by a series of the opposite. We have the bursts. At the present moment, half the world are going through a burst and the other half of the world are going through a boom. And so, in a little time, that boom will become a burst and that verse will become a boom. And nothing which, nothing that the governments can do will make any difference in the longer term because they're working with old methods which no longer work, no longer can be applied to the problem. We're in a new age and we need new values the young inherit this tendency and they want something new. They want something different from their fathers. And they don't want to inherit this boom, burst, boom, burst, boom, burst situation. They want to know where they are. They want to feel related to other people, their friends and people in other countries. And they want a world at peace, above all, a world not threatened by war. The problem currently 
is that the events in the world are proving stronger than the ability of humanity to deal with them. Because they're dealing with them with their own modality, their own technique. They mean well. Most of the governments of the world mean well. From time to time there are people who, I won't mention names, but you all know who they are, who are not really very nice men at all. And they don't have the, the, the uh, deeds of the world at heart, even though they might be in very high positions in their own country, their own environment. But broadly speaking, the governments of the world aim at, not perfection of course, but at some kind of, of common means. But they do it with the methods of the past. For example, the quality given to us in our past 2,000 years, above all, is the quality of individuality. So that makes for individual, separative thinking. I am an individual, you're an individual, we are all individuals, and the only way to be an individual is to assert your individuality. That's what people do. That's what governments do. And so you have competition between every individual, relatively speaking, and between every government, <coughs> actually speaking. You might say, well, individuality is a good thing. I'm, I'm for it. I don't think that's something we want to get rid of. And I, I agree, totally. But with the idealism of, Piscean, of the Piscean experience, that individuality has always become individual. I am an individual, so our idealism became an ideological thing. We built up ideologies, and it, people related themselves to ideologies, whether that is democracy or fascism or any communism or socialism or any other ism in the world. The, that these are creations of the mind of people for whom they make sense. It satisfies their own inner sense of individuality. Because of the marked individuality, the idealism of the Piscean mind is thwarted because the individuality makes it always idealistic in the personal sense. Me, my family, my city, my village, my city, my country. And that's how the, the world becomes divided. Each, the antagonisms are set up because you have greater countries and lesser countries, richer countries and poorer countries. And the, the aim always is to compete. That is the individualizing aspect of it. Now, that is always not very good for a country, but today that is terrible for a country. Really dangerous for any country, because today we have the means for the first time in the whole of history, the means of destroying all life on earth. That has never been the case before.